Hello there, guys. Um, so I've been getting a lot of questions about voice acting and how I got started in voice acting. And my name is Kim Rako. I am a professional voiceover actress and audiobook narrator. I am fully self-employed, and this is my full-time career. I work from home, and I've been asked dozens of times, more time than I can count on stream or in general in DMs, how someone can go about becoming a voice actor or get started with very limited to no experience whatsoever. So today I'm going to be talking to you guys about this, and this is probably going to be a relatively long video because there is a lot. There is a lot going into it. But here are some tips that I have for you about getting started. So the first uh, topic that I'm going to cover is equipment. Now, uh, I always suggest, without a doubt in my mind, never, ever, ever to use a USB-powered microphone uh, if you're getting started in voice acting. XLR microphones are the way to go, and you'll likely need a very decent audio interface as well, but we will get to that later. So first things first. Okay, the microphone of choice that I use is... Um, the Electro Voice RE20. It's an incredibly well-made broadcast quality dynamic cardio and microphone, and it has a built-in resistance for those annoying pop sounds. So, you know, pop, K, S, these sounds are very harsh with most microphones, and the RE20 has a very beautiful way of handling that. It's my go-to microphone really for everything that I do. So let's talk about uh, microphones and the difference between a cardio microphone and a, a dynamic microphone, because I get asked this a lot. So essentially, a cardio microphone uh, is a type of mic that picks up sounds with high gain from the front and the sides, but not from the rear. But the RE20 and the RE320, uh, which the RE320 is the cheaper, but honestly just as good version of the as the RE20, is uh, a very unique microphone that has something called variable D for a minimal proximity effect. Uh, so if I'm talking to the front of my microphone right here, and then I go over to the side, and then about that, it's going to be very quiet, very quiet, very quiet, very quiet, very loud, okay? Very cool. All right, so anyway, I prefer dynamic microphones as, a boy, as opposed to uh, condenser microphones. But it is your best bet to have both a cardioid condenser and a cardioid dynamic microphone in your home studio arsenal, in my opinion. And uh, the reason for this is, uh, you know, you're going to be doing different types of work and you want to be able to cover as many bases as possible. Uh, now, I... I prefer dynamic microphones as opposed to cardioid uh, dynamic microphones, as I said, uh, because I feel like I get a better range out of my voice. I feel like it sounds clearer and I have to worry less about noise. I will touch on more of this in a minute. If your budget does not allow for high end microphones, that's totally fine. But uh, I'm going to give you my suggestions as to what I think is a very important uh, place to start with your home studio. So. Condenser microphones are normally considered better for voice recording than and voiceover. So you want to think like, you know, you probably are familiar with the Shaw SM7B that retails at around $399. But as I've stated before, I swear by the RE20, which retails at about $449 or the RE320, which costs about $299. US dollars by Electro Voice. If your budget does not allow for high-end microphones and you're just getting started, I would suggest picking up the Audio-Technica AT2020 uh, for a cardio condenser microphone, which retails at about 149 US dollars. And the Audio-Technica AT, no, AT2005 USB XLR cardioid dynamic microphone, which retails at, I think, $79. I will put the links in the description down below for every single mic that I'm talking about. I would not suggest ever uh, going cheaper than these microphones because anything other than this is just going to have significant background distortion and audio quality issues. When I first got started, I tried using a Blue Yeti USB microphone and I was able to get some very low quality gigs. I am ashamed of myself and honestly, it, it, it's just a mess. I would never recommend starting with a USB interface ever again. However, okay, so if you're going to use a cardioid condenser microphone, you need to ensure that you are in a quiet area and perhaps invest in some soundproof foam. There are plenty of DIYs on the internet for creating sound booths or one of my old favorite tricks when I was first getting started is to throw a comforter over your head or a foam blanket uh, when recording. But due to the fact that this is both expensive and the latter can get very, very, very hot when you're recording, I always recommend a good dynamic microphone because they 
they significantly cut down on background noise. And uh, wow, I just smashed my desk. Now this is this is very very important in my opinion. So anyway, a link for another thing I will talk about is uh, a great idea is to get an external audio interface. You're going to need this for an XLR microphone. It's a must have for anyone who is serious about getting into voice acting because it allows you to control your gain and to plug your microphone directly into your device, which will feed then into your computer. Uh, a lot of people will, you know, I recommend the Scarlett 2i2 USB audio interface, which retails at 169 US dollars. Or my favorite alternative is the Sound Blaster K3 amplifier, which is amazing, in my opinion, for live streaming as well as voice recordings. And because it's an external sound card, it actually makes all of your audio much louder so you can actually hear a lot of things in your recordings that you might not hear otherwise. But the Scarlett 2i2 is a really good place to start as well. I recently started using the GoXLR by TC Helicon, uh, and I've since gotten rid of several of my vocal processes that I used to use. I used to use a Cloudlifter, a Roland VT3, uh, a Yamaha mixer, a Scarlett, a bunch of shit, and now I only use one device. So it really depends on what your budget is and if you want to you know, start small and grow up, or if you just want to dive all in and commit to it and buy something. I wouldn't really recommend the latter, but... You know, I, I can't say anything but positive things about the Go XLR um, I, because uh, it's got a built-in DSA, gain control, a noise gate. It's got compressors, and it's going to save you a ton of editing time on your projects. So keep in mind the Go XLR is completely highly customizable, and as such, your individual settings are going to vary, vary very greatly from you know tutorials that you're going to find online, uh, let's say on YouTube. Uh, um, but this is because every microphone is different, and every voice is different. And you're going to have all these videos that are clickbait that are like, the best settings for the Go XLR. No, you're going to have to fiddle with yourself. You can use this as a baseline, but you're going to want to fiddle for your own voice. Uh, anyway, moving along. Uh, you're going to need to invest in some good quality XLR cables on the off chance that your microphone does not come with one. A lot of problems that I used to have with my audio setup when I was first getting started was, uh, you know, I would have noise issues. And they were pretty much eliminated completely with good high quality cables. So I can't swear by anything. I swear by cables. Fuck. Uh, no, anyway, uh, you also uh, you need to keep in mind that you're going to want to have good quality headphones. Studio monitoring headphones are very, very important. I myself am using the Audio-Technica ATH M50X monitor headphones. They are great, but they do kind of press on your head a little bit. Uh, during long sessions. So if you're wearing them for a couple of hours, you're not going to notice it. If you're sitting for 12 hours and you're working straight, yes, I do that. I'm crazy. You will notice that it, it you know, it's, it hurts. Um, I think they retail at around $169 prior to upgrading to this. However, I used to use a Steel Series Arctis, I think five headset. And yes, it was a gaming headset, but it was incredibly comfortable and the sound was actually really good for a gaming headset. Now there are people who will say otherwise, of course, because they're, you know, there's headset affection autos and whatnot. But my advice is this, okay? A comfortable headset is very, 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 very important. And the only thing better than that that's more important is the sound that you're getting out of it that you can monitor yourself because if you're sitting there uncomfortable during a long recording session it's really not fair to yourself uh avoid earbuds you want to ensure that you have a cl closed back headphone because you need to be able to listen for background noise and be confident in the product that you are going to be delivering to a client uh moving on to recording software the best recording software or digital audio workstation in my opinion is audacity hands down it's incredibly easy to use and there are several plugins that you can get to check on your quality and it's absolutely wonderful i've actually used audacity to record projects that i've winded up on cable tv and on commercials so anyone who tells you that you need something expensive like a reaper is quite frankly full of absolute bollocks don't listen to them so if you're doing audiobooks, there are certain macros and plugins that you're going to need to make use of for Audacity, like the ACX Check Macro for the Amazon Audio Standard for audiobooks. And I believe you also need a VST plugin to enable you to save or create MP3s or maybe it's 16-bit waves. I don't remember. It's been a long time. But, you know, there's that. And otherwise, if you're going to move on to a paid software Adobe Audition or Reaper are amazing, but I cannot speak really for other programs because I have very limited hands-on experience with them. And I find myself really only touching Reaper or Audition for singing projects that re require certain VSTs. Uh, 
to use. Uh, moving on to other must-have things. Let's talk about a demo reel. That's very important. You're going to want to have a demo reel that showcases your talent. And this should be you, uh, you know, and you can start it however that is. Now, if you can do accents, that's great. If you can't and it's just you without that, that's fine. Run different lines. Showcase your emotions. Showcase your versatility and what makes you stand out. Uh, if you can do accents, that's wonderful. That's a bonus, okay? But what really matters is that you keep your demo under three minutes in length and give yourself time to shine. I think my... My demo that I use is around a minute long-ish. I don't know. But you need to have a voice demo kind of just like you need to have a resume, right? So it's very important. And I would never really suggest hiring someone to make a demo for you because you're just going to get ripped off. I wouldn't suggest doing that until you're very experienced. And even then, it really isn't that necessary unless you just kind of want a little bit of clout. And you could say, hey, I work with this person and they produce this demo. And then, oh, God, I can feel the hate burrowing into me now. But trust me. Trust me, you can do everything on your own without any help. You can listen to other people's demos and you can do your own. And a lot of people will tell you to hire a professional, but nah, you don't need that shit. You don't. You want to be a self-made person. And as a result, you don't need anyone telling you what works and what doesn't because you should be able to reasonably compare your reel to that of other actors and know rather your reel is on the right track. If you're going to be starting off, odds are you're going to be starting off freelancing, building a resume, and you're going to be working for dirt. And it's going to suck the first year or so that you do this, most likely. But you need to know your worth because people are going to try to rip you off. Because if you're not in a union, and I really honestly don't think that you should do join a union unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, people are going to make you question your worth and they're going to try to milk you and get as much out of you as possible. In my opinion, a good starting rate is about $5 per 200 words. If we're talking narration and not voice acting, I'd say $100 per finished hour with a royalty share plus deal. But these rates are rubbish and you need to understand that you will constantly have people trying to exploit you and push the limits of what they think they can get out of you because if you don't have that experience there are people online who will target that and try to exploit it so the more experience that you get and the more gigs that you have under your belt you're going to gradually increase your pricing and that's just how it has to be I myself am now charging rates that I'm comfortable with because I know my production standards are worth it. And I know that I had existing clients that were treating me very disrespectfully and I have a line now that I never cross. Um, so there's that. Um, let's see. As far as agents go, that's really up to you. But I don't believe that you need an agent until you're bigger and you need to let yourself grow before you start trying to be competitive to other more well-established well actors. And there is absolutely enough work out there to be had that you can make a full-time career without having an agent, without having an agency, without having, you know, all of these things that people try to tell you that you need. Uh, other tips. Other tips. Uh, a website. A website that's professional is a very good idea. Social media is a good idea because it all, it all feeds into each other, right? If you have an Instagram, great. If you don't, that's fine. You should be making use probably of social media to grow your base. Um, I absolutely suck at this because I'm antisocial and I hate social media. But over time, my following has grown a little here and there. And some of that is due to, you know, maybe social media. Um, uh, but a lot of it's due to my work, but most of it is it's due to work that I've got based on word of mouth, people that I've worked with in the past from freelancing companies that have decided to work with me on a one on one basis, people that have found me on Google, uh, people that have found my reel or found me on IMDb. Uh, there's that. So also, this is something that can you can keep in mind as well. Uh, when you get started and you start to get to a medium phase where you're kind of you know, getting a good amount of work coming in, you might get offered a very good amount of money to do stand in and dub over work for ever voice artists and actors if you grow and you can do impressions of them. What that means is you'll be impersonating uh, actors like maybe they're sick and they can't get into the studio that time. And so they want to hire somebody that can sound just like them for an episode of something, right? Uh, and oftentimes that project will buy out the rights or the credits to use your voice and you'll have to sign an NDA and you will not get a credit for your work on that project. I have done this far more times than I can count and it's actually how I've made the most money in the industry thus far. 
it's also happened not just on voice over projects but on narration projects as well like let's say an author wants to hire you to produce their audiobook but they don't want your name associated with it because they want to have credit for narrating the book themselves or something like that so that's called a credit buyout and that's something that happens often if you're willing to give up that credit or notch in your belt for a paycheck sometimes it's worth it other times it isn't you have to ask yourself what's worth it and what is not uh finding work voiceover is a very changing and growing industry and i think some of the best places to get started are fiverr and upwork these are places that require you to have absolutely no experience and you can set your own rates from the get-go keep in mind that fiverr takes about 20 percent of all of your income but i went full-time just from being on fiverr and ended up expanding from there um I mean, before that, I used to do small gigs and whatnot, but Fiverr has been amazing. But it's also a, if you can get off of Fiverr, I would not keep it as your main source of income, obviously. There's also ACX audiobook narrator kids. You're going to probably start doing very bad, very terrible audiobooks, and they are great experience. They will give you a sense of how much time you should be expecting to invest per hour, how much time it costs you, how much money you can earn. You can audition for free for audiobooks to narrate and upload your own reels and demos from there. Also, authors can find you based on the rates that you set on the ACX website, and you can work for royalty share if you're just getting started. Again, I would not recommend that, but desperate times, you might have to. These are all building blocks, and it's important to work on your talents over time, learning other accents and dialects and tones and pitches and what you can do. Investing that time into yourself is a great thing, but I don't think that you. it's necessary for you to, um, you know, hire people. You know, if you want, you can invest with some lessons with a vocal coach, but there are so many tutorials for accents on YouTube and so many great resources that I think that anything that you want to learn is if you put the time in, you can teach yourself. So anyway, I hope that this has been useful. If there are any questions that I did not answer, please feel free to ask me in the comments down below and I will try to help you and get to it. Anyway. Thanks for checking out the video, and I hope you guys will stop DMing me now about how I became a voice actor. Bye.